bit crazy because I have the headphone in so I can listen to that to make sure it's recording audio. This feels like madness. I'm listening to myself on like a half second delay. Um, okay, so, so we're gonna have um, a little bit of talk about the mentor program and then we're gonna dive in with Dr. Havlin. But before we get started, um, we had a couple of extra mix, missed quiz questions. It's hard to even talk when you're listening to this. Okay, um, and one of the things people were having a hard time with was simple versus compound leaves and alternate versus opposite which is hard, is hard, right? Like I totally get that. So for a compound leaf, I want you to think about something that's almost lacy. So this is from our Yara plants out front. You could also think about a hickory tree, right? Where you have a, one kind of central stem-like thing with a bunch of little tiny leaves off of it that then attaches to the actual stem, right? And that's where you'll see the node at the base and you'll see all these other structures. And so if you wanna go out and like paw our yarrow plants out in the front garden, you'll see this is one leaf, even though it looks like a bunch of little leaves, right? And that's in contrast to something that's just got a simple leaf where, and I'll, I know these are tiny and I'm sorry, but if you look, this is the leaf and then there's actually this bud right here that's poking out. And I can even pass these around. And then for simple versus, or for alternate versus opposite, right? Opposite, they are opposite from each other. Alternate, right? They are alternating. Okay, that's kind of how I think about that. So just look at plants, you'll see it more. Sometimes compound stuff can get a little bit confusing because it's hard to know what they're doing, but just as you look at more and more plants, you'll see the differences. So did anyone else have any like real questions? Yeah. I have a question about our project. Sure. Um, I'm trying to visualize how to put this together. I would be inclined to put it in a, a uh, slide format. Are we going to be showing our reports to each other? You will not be sharing them with each other. And so we have examples of, do we have the example here today, Barbara, of, a, of how someone did it in a binder? We've had people do it, yeah, kind of in like, like a binder, but not a binder if, if you're more electronic, right? Like document, just a package of documents. Okay. Um, but you, you won't be presenting it to each other, so fortunately you don't need to make like a slideshow or overheads or anything like that. Okay, then how about, um, surely would be worth it to have a couple of photographs in there of like before and after? Yeah. Can I, can I use those? You can absolutely use those. I mean, we have everything from like crazy technical type A binder, which like is after my own heart, to like construction paper and collages right, and like fold out sections, like I saw that last time and I loved it, to like, here's my USB, right? <laughs> like, you go through the spreadsheets. Um, and all of those work. Like, we're super open to the format. Any other? Yes. Going back to the leaf structure, someone asked me, is there any reason why those leaves are different shapes other than from an identification family or origin standpoint? Do they Kind of. Okay, so the question is, um, why do we have different leaf shapes and why are they have different names? They have different names because botanists love naming a thing, right? Like that is the thing deep in a botanist's heart. But the reason that a botanist likes to name different things is because often, like we talked about how flowers are very, very conserved by evolution, leaf shapes often um, are actually more susceptible to evolution. Like they're more susceptible to being changed by forces outside of them. So oftentimes, um, like one of the classic examples is uh, Monstera actually, the house plant. Monstera has beautiful cuts in the leaves. They're called fenestrations, um, which is a fun word. It's from the Latin term window. Uh, pro tip from today, to defenestrate something is to throw it out a window. But so Monstera has these beautiful cuts in the leaves and it's actually because it's a vine that grows up a tree in somewhat windy conditions. And the idea is that basically the wind can move through those cuts more easily without tearing the leaf. Right, so there are all these evolutionary reasons why we think that plants have different leaf shapes. Some plants have leaves that actually in, in water conditions will turn almost into root-like structures. Right, all of these different things are going on. The idea is that it helps them better adapt to their environment in one way or another. The thing I will say too though is that for many of these things, biologists have not actually tested 
what we say is the reason, right? We just like, like with the Monstera, we say that, but I've never seen a research paper to support that. So we think that's what it is, but it's not tested and we don't know yet, but it's kind of our best case idea right now. Um, in evolutionary biology, we call them just so stories that something is, it's a reference to Richard Kipling that these are just so because that's how they must be. So different names because it helps us identify them and because botanists love names. Different shapes typically for, for evolutionary reasons. Yeah. That's the problem. When you ask me an evolutionary question, I'm like, <laughs> let me tell you about it. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to introduce Lynn. Lynn is class of 2019, so she understands what you guys are feeling right now. Um, she, uh, along with her co-chair, Cy Gurney, who's not here today, they um, took a chance and uh, beautifully revamped our mentor program. It is so phenomenal, so uh, she is going to tell you about that. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Well, I've heard and uh, heard so much about you guys. It's very, very exciting to have you starting the program with us and kind of moving through the process that I was doing just a couple of years ago. Um, I emailed all of you yesterday. Hopefully, you saw the email. If you didn't, no big deal. Um, and you may or may not have had a chance to read that document that I attached, but again, no big deal because I'm going to hit some of the highlights right now. I'm going to keep this short and sweet because you guys need to be learning about soil today. But um, we did want to just take a few minutes to talk about this mentorship program. And so um, all of you should have found a manila folder on your chair that has a copy of this document that I had attached yesterday, as well as three or four other documents. One is just a list of the mentors and mentees. So if you don't already know who your mentor is, you now have an official record of who your mentor is. I know many of you have already heard from your mentors. If you have not, you will be very soon. So just hang tight. Um, but I know for a fact that some of you already have uh, talked to or at least emailed with your mentors. Um, so very briefly, um, this comes from the North Carolina State Guidelines. The goal of a mentor is to welcome students into the uh, Master Garden initial training program and coach them from the time that they attend training until they become well established in the program. And to take it a step farther, mentors are here to welcome, support, and guide you. All of you are here because you're ultra-motivated to get through. Um, and so, you know, you're going to be jumping in and being, you know, excited about all the kinds of things you want to learn. The mentor is just here as a, as a guide for you. And all of you are going to have different needs. Some of you are going to maybe want to talk to your mentor more frequently. Some of you may not need to talk as much. And I'd love to talk about what your responsibilities are with your mentor. They have all been trained, and they're going to be touching base with you. But you need to also understand and, and, and work that relationship with your mentor. So obviously, if you haven't already, when you get in touch with them, make sure you have contact information for them. Make sure that you and your mentor talk about the best ways that you enjoy communicating with each other, whether it's email, text, phone. in person's getting tricky again right now. So you know, we'll just have to play it by ear with those things. And, and then contact your mentor whenever you have questions or you're unsure about something. Don't worry about feeling real or dumb. Um, that's what they're there for. And I will also tell you that mentors, myself included, don't have all the answers. But here's what's great. If they don't have the answer, they know who to go to to get the answer. And they'll either point you to that person or they'll go get it and get back to you. So they're not going to be the, the be all end all, but they're, they're there again to help introduce you to other people in the program. Um, recognize that your mentor is a friendly, supportive face who will not necessarily have all the answers. Oh, I'm ahead of myself, I already covered that. <laughs> and then finally, be proactive with your interests with regard to becoming a master gardener. I think you guys already probably have that in spades, but you know what your interests are. And once, you know, 
once you finish the training, you're going to have lots of ways to explore our program and ways to explore volunteering. Which brings me down to the bottom of the first page with the phases that you go through to get certified. Right now, you all are in the student phase. And over the next 14 weeks, you're going to continue to open your skull and let all this information get poured in and sit there and go, oh, I cannot remember all this stuff. But then you also get the tools on how to look it back up later, which is really the key to all of this. Um, in November, unless there's a snow day or something, uh, you're going to wrap up this training and you're going to move into the intern phase. And that's going to be the bulk of 2022. So you've got plenty of time to get your volunteer hours and your extra ed, continuing ed hours next year. But that's when your mentor really is going to be helpful. Because we have developed this checklist. It's called the mentee checklist. It might look a little complicated. Stay calm. It's not. It is your roadmap. And really what it is, is it identifies all of the different types of volunteer opportunities that are available. And by having it as a checklist, it gives you a little bit of a guide of some of the different things that you might want to find out about. You know, there's not going to be an open forum for writing in the blog or in the newsletter. But if that's something you're interested in, you can talk to the people that already do that, and your mentor can help hook you up with those people. That's just one of many examples here. So you will own this checklist. It is yours. It is your guide to get you to certification. But your mentor will also have a copy of this checklist and will probably use it as a way to check in with you. How are you doing with this? Do you have any questions? Is there something on here that you're particularly interested in that I can help you, you know, connect with some folks? Is there stuff on here that scares you? You know, I personally was scared to death to go to my first public event. I was sure, and in fact it did happen, that everyone would come up and ask me questions I didn't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. And it was scary. Now, in the end, yeah, you just do the best you can, you look stuff up, you're someone else is there that frequently does know because our master gardens and gardeners in this program are crazy knowledgeable. I'm still learning, but they're, they're amazing. Um, but you might have your mentor co come with you to the first public event. Or if they're not big on public events, they'll find someone else to come with you. Or you might just show up at the table like I did and say, guys, I'm brand new, I don't know any of this. Is there somebody here that can help me? And everyone just jumps in to help. So being able to just look at and own the things that you're super excited about, but also the things that you might feel a little bit of anxiety about, that's all good. Because that's what the mentors here is to help you with those parts of the program, if in fact they exist for you. And they may not. So I would love, if you haven't already, to take a look at the materials, the other two documents in the folder are just some basic information about the mentors, as well as basic information about all y'all, um, so that people can sort of see and share with each other. Uh, I'm going to be back at this class next Thursday. If you have any questions, you look over the checklist a little more closely or something, you have any check questions, I'll certainly be here to answer questions. But your mentor can also answer those questions. Um, Last but not least, I think most of you already know there's going to be a meetup out at Briggs Community Garden on the 29th of August from 3 to 4 as an opportunity to meet face to face with not only your mentor but the other mentors. Um, some, if you cannot attend that um, session, it's not required, but we would sure love to have you there. If you cannot attend, please just let your mentor know so that they can be aware of the fact that you're not going to show up. And um, you know, on the other hand, I'm also going to be tracking any mentors that can't show up. And I will certainly scoop up and chat it up with anybody whose mentor cannot make it. So um, with that, has anyone got, anyone got any general questions? Would be in August 29th, what time at the Three to four. And by the way, there is a sign up, that is an event in the calendar on the intranet. 
Some of you have already signed up for it. If you have not, it's a great way to practice signing up for an event in the intranet. You just go into the intranet, click on the calendar, go to the 29th of August, you will see it there, and you can click and then just add your name to the list. So it's a great way. That way, afterwards, when you click, your hours get automatically added. It's kind of fun. Um, any other questions? Yes, on the, uh, the mentor, the preferred communication uh, email, uh, that made it absolutely no telephone call? No, no, no. It, you can still communicate in other ways. It's just that when we ask the mentors what their preferred way was, they threw that down. But it doesn't mean that they won't accept other communication methods. Of, and in fact, if your best method of communication is phone, yes. then, then tell them that and they'll say, we're on it. Okay? So not a problem. Thanks. That's a great question. Anything else? Yes? Does the new report or when you sign up on the internet, it adds your hours, it adds your hours not just for like, um, like what? Like an event, I guess? Well, what's a, what's, it goes towards hours this year. Uh -huh. um, the hours get reset at the beginning of the calendar year. So it, it, it goes towards some small amount of hours that you will accrue, uh, including a huge amount of education hours that you will accrue this fall. Uh, but your real sort of adding of hours is actually going to be starting January 1. Uh, but it's a good practice. <laughs> yes? As far as education hours go, I put in the hour and a half that I watch Fantastic Fungi, which is a terrific program uh huh. Is that a legitimate? It, I mean, sure, educated me. It gave me pictures of mycelium and all that good stuff. I'm going to turn that one over to Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great, so yes. But normally, um, email me first and just be like, hey, does this count? Normally, uh, we have those approved ahead of time, although that sounds delightful. I do think you should learn about fungi, so that's great. Um, do we have any more questions for Lynn? All right, real quick. Um, yeah, woohoo! Go ahead. Woo <laughs> so, uh, before I let Dr. Havlin take over, two points from Matt that I love. One, Lynn is a retired, like, program development, mentorship development guru, right? That's basically right. Ish, yeah. yeah. Um, you might be here because you're like, I love gardening. You have other skills that you would never think relate to what we do here, we will find them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so know that that's one of the cool things about our program is there's so many ways to get back. And second, this point, and this is gonna be especially relevant for today. You do not have to remember everything. You do not have to know everything. You have to know, yes, I can look it up, right? Yes, I can come back to it. If I didn't catch the first, second, or third time, I'll try again. <laughs> Maybe it'll catch the next time. And so for soils especially, I know that can be, um, these can, this can be an intimidating topic, but you'll get it eventually. Don't worry, we'll work with you. Um, and so with that, I am gonna hand it over to Dr. Havlin. He is our soil speaker extraordinaire from NC State. He's always fun. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Uh, congratulations on really a super, uh, experience for you um, as you look at our younger folk coming out of high school and etc they know very little about food and so forth and so on and they know less and less about these fundamental topics that are so important called chemistry math and physics and biology so I'm sorry but I'm talking about soils today <laughs> this is dirt day <laughs> And uh, that's chemistry, math, physics, and biology. So I can't really make this a topic about, well, how do you feel about soil today? I can't do that. It's just not the truth. And I'm one of these that, that we're going to give you the truth. Now, so you're in for a real treat today. You're going to learn a ton. Um, I hope by the end of the several hours that it doesn't feel like it was a uh, root canal, it was really still as a treat for you. 
But I want to just preface everything that's going to happen here in the next few hours by saying that, no, you're not going to have it all understood. There's no way. It's, a very, it's the most complex matrix on the earth. We think about the oceans being, we know more about the ocean ecosystem than we know about soil. So, uh, and I'm thrilled to hear you, you watch the fungi. Uh, I sat there and watched it with my five-year-old grandson the other day, and he loved it. I thought it kind of dealt, denigrated into the psilocybin thing a little bit too much at the end, but I didn't want him to see all that part, but it was very well done. Uh, and of course, that's soil. That's part of soil. Uh, you remember when, uh, a lot of you do remember when we landed on the moon and we brought back lunar soil? That's a lie. That's not soil. Because there's no life in it. There's no water. Soil is biology, chemistry, physics. So when I talk to my students, and I've been doing this a long time, uh, you know, I try to motivate them that at the end of the class, that they walk out going, oh, that was really fun. That was really exciting. I learned so much. Um, but it, it's hard to get them to feel that way after a semester talking about it if you have lots of chemistry, math, and physics, and biology. It's just one of those things. So I'm trying to make this so that it is enjoyable. I encourage you to ask questions as we move along. Um, if we get all of you asking eight questions, we're never going to make it through even half of this. So some of it I'm going to go through faster than other parts. Um, we're going to start with three, we're going to cover three basic issues with soil, topics with soils, and that's water, organic matter, and nutrients. Now there's a lot more involved with soils than those three things, but that's really the three issues that you're going to be working with mostly. Water, organic matter, and nutrients. And the nutrient side is you remember in the campaign, in the 2020 campaign, I'm just not going to be any politics involved. There was a candidate, I think Bloomberg from New York or something, got up and said, well, agriculture is really simple stuff. We don't need to pay much attention to that. You just dig a hole, throw corn in the hole, put some dirt in it, and add some water, and boom, you got corn. How hard can that be? Well, you know that if you walk out to wherever you are, your garden, your field, whatever the, you're working with, and you do that, sweet corn, for example, or green beans, or whatever it is, you're going to be very disappointed if you haven't had a soil test first. And the soil test, take a sample, I'll show you how all of this is done in a minute. You get a report. You get this long list. If you wanted to take a peek, we're going to use, you have this handout, this soil test report. We're going through this today. You'll at least know what the terms mean and how they relate to each other by the end of the day. When you go to the doctor and you've had a physical, what do you get? You get this long list of measures. You get what? Glucose, you get cholesterol, you know, HDL and LDL and total, and you get, what else? Uh, blood pressure and, I don't know, PSA and all kinds of biochemical terms. And if they're out of whack, then the doctor says, you got a problem here or there. And so you, hopefully you start doing your homework and you look it up. You just don't take their word for it. You start doing some reading, don't you? Well, it's no different with soil. We're going to have a physical data. Now, <clears throat> there's uh, two different forms of this report. So we're going to go through the both forms. Uh, you, when you, after today, you go, oh, that really made a lot of sense. But the next time you see a one six months from now, you're going to go, what the heck is this thing? And you'll want to refer back to either the video. Uh, Ms. Ashley will help you at every turn. Your mentors, they, they know how to interpret these things, so they'll help you. I have an email and a phone number. That's my cell. I do not answer my cell. If I don't recognize your phone number, you know the shtick because we get all these wild calls from we're all over the place. But leave a message and I will call you right back. Tell me I'm the, you're the master gardener from Durham County and I will call you right back. Um, but I would contact these folks first, um, unless you really think uh, you, you want, and then that's fine. Anyway, so that's what we're gonna do today. 
Um, and then uh, when you finally find out that I've got a problem, and my blood pressure's too high or low or whatever it is, I have to do something about it. So I have to go somewhere and buy a product. Now I don't care whether you're organic and you buy composted animal waste, a bag of cow manure from Home Depot, <laughs> or you use fertilizer. So I'll distinguish between both sources. They're both fine, they're both good. Neither one is more or less detrimental to the environment as the other, despite what you may have heard. Fertilizer is not bad, it's the misuse of it that's bad, as is with everything in life, right? Alcohol and tobacco and all that <laughs> good stuff, right? Drugs. But the question is, I go to Home Depot and I know I need to apply two pounds of phosphorus per thousand square feet in my garden. Well, how many bags, uh, wait a minute, they got 18 different bags of fertilizer with different numbers on it. Which one do I buy? And how many bags do I buy and how many bags do I apply? We will go through that if we have time today. If not, I handed out the questions and on the back are the answers. <laughs> in case we run out of time. Um, and uh, we can come back and go through those or Ashley can, can take, take, you, take you through those. So again, uh, this is a really complex material. It's really tough to, to get everybody up to speed in just a few hours, but we're going to do the best we can. Um, let's see if I can get it. So when I walk, walk across the landscape, if you have a small garden, backyard, or, or a half acre, whatever it is, how many have got uh, more than an acre you're going to be playing with? Can you tell me how big? Five acres? No, no, two and a half. Two and a half? One and a half? Okay. Well, when you're at that scale, uh, there could be some differences in soil, but not likely. And if you're in urban, re suburban areas, and you're, even though the backyard may be large, it's potential for being highly disturbed due to the building construction. So you may have very, very serious problems that are not native soil related. Um, and so we need to go through those. But as I walk across the United States, there's dirt, it's just not dirt. Everything's different. All soils are not the same. Uh, a lot of the behaviors can be the same, but there are a lot of different properties. For example, if I bought you blindfold me and put me on an airplane and drop me off in Denver, Colorado, first thing I do is I, I want to know about soils. I say, well, what's the climate here? What do they say? Dry? Yeah, it's an arid environment, semi-arid environment. So it doesn't get much rain. <clears throat> well, then I say, okay, I, I, you're gonna have a micronutrient problem. All your soils are gonna be relatively high pH, and you're gonna have micronutrient deficiencies. Those are the ones I'm gonna focus on. There are some soils in Colorado, et cetera, that are phosphorus deficient and so forth, but not as many as here. But if you drop me off in RDU, and get off the plane, what kind of climate do they have? They say, well, it rains a lot, it's really hot. All your soils are acid, so you've got a lime. You're gonna need some lime depending upon the crop you grow. Now, if you're blueberries, you don't wanna do that. Azaleas, rhododendrons, those are acid-loving plants. So don't lime your, when you're spreading lime in your yard, make sure you don't spread it out into the azalea bushes. The blueberries are a very acid-loving plant. So, uh, again, we have this wonderful soil in the southeast called an altosol. You don't need to remember any of these names. I hope you don't ever have, they don't give you a test question. You don't remember any of this. This is just how we define or label soils. It's just like uh, a genus and species and family and all that in plants and an insects and animals and so forth. We have a nomenclature for soils, which you don't need to know. But your county agent types uh, will have that information if you need it. But in a landscape, I have several different of these soils. Now they're related because they all formed under the same long-term millennia of environment. They formed that way. So we're gonna talk about why they're different in North Carolina than they are uh, elsewhere. So when you have a soil, and you dig down the rooting depth, you find variations in, in properties and, and 
parameters. So let's just quickly go through what the soil looks like from the surface all the way down. And we call this a profile, and we label various horizons. You don't need to re remember that, but this surface is the most important for a lot of reasons. Nutrients, water. Very important that you pay attention to this guy. This is what we call the O-horizon, and that's the surface of the soil that you have generally, you see dead plant materials. And you want to see a lot of dead plant materials. You want an O-horizon, and I'll explain that here when we get to the organic matter section. So that's mostly organic matter residues. It's very porous. When it rains, you'll get 20 minutes of infiltration of that rainfall water or irrigation water but if it was bare soil, you might only get five minutes. And the rest of that water runs off. And what you want to do when it rain or irrigate, you want as much of what you applied, either by nature or by turning on the, the spigot, to get into the profile. Because you want to fill this up with plant available water, so during the hot parts of the next week or whatever, you've got water there these plants can use. Don't want them to run out. And especially, uh, if you're growing carrots and beets, tuberous crops, the tap-rooted crops where the rooting system is very shallow, why they don't have long roots to go down here and find available water. So you've got to make sure this is porous enough. Anyway, as I increase the organic matter content, I also increase a property called cation exchange capacity, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, a little bit, uh, and that holds nutrients. So the organic fraction is a storehouse for nutrients. So when I find a soil and I know it's low organic matter, that's usually my first goal is well, how, what kind of management do I have to do to increase that surface soil organic matter? And that's not generally uh, just planting this crop or that crop or rotating. It's I need to import more carbon than my crop rotation will provide by leaving the old residue on the soil surface from the crops that I'm harvesting. I'm actually buying carbon from somewhere else and putting it in my garden or my, my landscape area. And we'll talk about that, that's where we're headed. Anyway, uh, so again, this A horizon is below there and it has some more clay, more, uh, which I'll define what clays are in a minute. This is what we call, you heard this phrase, called a topsoil. That's what, that, that's what that is, you know, that's the part that you soil sample and send to the lab. Now, in North Carolina, many of the soils before we built cities and so forth, were farmed with cotton and tobacco two or three hundred years ago. And we cut down the forest, which is all forested area mostly. And uh, those soils are severely eroded. So most of the A, O, and A are gone. You're farming in this layer. So that's why I say when you find the soil that you're dealing with, this is the topsoil. This is where, this is the surface. You better figure out a way to increase organic matter. We'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, so uh, the B horizon is mostly clay, low organic matter, but the clay holds with lots of water. So if I can get all my nutrients up here and water, and I can get roots down here like corn and deep rooted crops, I can get roots down there that'll pull out that plant available water and allow that crop to, to grow during the July and August high ET periods that you, you're well aware. And then below that is parent material, the evidence of the original rocks and so forth that the soil formed from. What does OM mean? Organic matter. Oh. Organic matter. Thank you. So, beautiful farm, different landscapes. I got slopey land, top land, bottom ground. These are things that I use to kind of tell me where should I put which plants. Some plants do great down here because I get a lot, I get the same amount of rainfall everywhere, right? But since I got a slope here, I get more runoff on the slope. So this actually ends up with a little more water than up, up here. I want to put corn and you know those kind of crops down here beans and, and garden crops, but on that slope, that's where I put my wine grapes. They don't like a lot of water and a lot of nutrients. You want to stress those. So, so it just depends on, 
Uh, so landscape position is really important, and, and the soil is right. Notice this bottom ground soil is nice and dark, high organic matter content, and that's because it's organic fractions, a, a residue washes down here over thousands of years, and, and up here on the side slope, it's not so much organic, not as much organic matter. Again, this is generally what you're going to find in most of your areas. Anyway, we are blessed with this soil called the Meltasol. It's the second most highly weathered soil on the planet. What does that mean? That means when it was formed, it's formed under high rainfall and high temperature. And as a result of that, it influences the ultimate chemistry of that soil. What's the most weathered? Highest rainfall, highest temperature. Where would that exist on the planet? Yes, yes, we, equatorial regions, absolutely correct, yeah. And those, P, those soils are pH 3 or less, and uh, uh, they're really hard to farm. So the Brazilians have, uh, do, they've taken down the Amazon forest, they've taken down well over a third of it already, uh, not just the Brazilians, but the, the countries that, that uh, have a, that ecosystem. And, uh, and they're trying to grow corn and beans mostly pasture because they found out corn and beans don't do very well. It takes a lot of inputs to, to do that. Pasture grass, not so much. Anyway, uh, so in North Carolina, you're blessed with this highly weathered soil. So what does that mean? That means immediately I've got some influences of the way that soil was developed on property. So why is it acid? Why do we have acid soil? All, I'm serious, you're all going to have to line the soil depending on the crop you're, you're growing. you got to line it. So why is it acid? Well, here's the rainfall distribution. You can't see these numbers, but this is higher rainfall here than here, right? This is desert, semi-arid, and this is high rainfall. That's high rainfall. And the dark areas on that map is low pH, low pH. So the more rainfall, the more acid. So that's why our soils are acid. That's why I say blindfold me and drop me off in Denver and I can tell you my pHs are seven and a half or eight. I know I never have to line those, but in North Carolina, I'm always gonna have to use lime. So when you know you're gonna have that input, we better understand that I gotta have a soil test. I gotta know what my pH is, what my target pH is, and how much lime I need to buy and apply, and what lime product. So we gotta take time to describe lime products. So, this is no, no way around it. You go to Home Depot and you get three, two, two or three choices of lime products. Which one do I buy? And how many bags do I need? Really important uh, decisions that you can make. Well, again, uh, pH is, is, is influenced, the low pH is influenced because we have more rainfall. What is the pH of natural rainfall? Unpolluted rainfall. I love when I say unpolluted because immediately you want to think. Unpolluted rainfall is pH seven. seven. What do you, anybody else? Do I hear 7.2? Do I hear 6.8? Well, it's five and seven, five point seven. The slide says it's slightly acid. And that's important for life on the planet. If rainfall didn't have slightly acidic pH, why the rocks that the earth is made up of wouldn't slowly dissolve over millions of years if it was slightly acidic. And so under CO2 partial pressure, we get some acid. Now, look at that. I just threw out a chemistry, chemical equation. You don't have to memorize this. You're not going to be asked to repeat it. But in order to understand this soil test report and understand what's on those fertilizer bag and lime bag and how to do, make, this, make these decisions correct, not over apply, not under apply. I've got to know cations and anions. And you, most of you do already, right? Cation is a positive ion and an anion is negative. So that's a cation, hydrogen, but it's an acid. It's a bad guy, I put it in red. I'll put the good guys in blue later. <laughs> but that's what happens. So as our soils develop in North Carolina, well guess what? The acid, with all that water running through, removes the good guys. Notice they're in blue. 
You recognize these three? What are they? Calcium, magnesium, potassium. As a master gardener, you have to know these things. You have to know these. These are essential plant nutrients. And they are loaded in soils, but not so much in our acid soils as they are in Denver soils that aren't so highly weathered. Because these rocks that contain a lot of calcium, magnesium, potassium, dissolved and weathered out over millennia, and, uh, we, but we still have some. Now we have a property that develops, I'll talk about that in a minute, called the cation exchange capacity, and it hangs on to these guys. But it doesn't hang on to sodium. Sodium is also a basic cation. Salt shaker on the kitchen table, sodium chloride. Sodium plus the chloride. The sodium parts, the basic cation. Well, the soils don't hang on to sodium. So where does the sodium go? It stays in the water, down to the ocean. That's why we have salt water in the oceans and not in Jordan Lake or whatever lake. But as a result, that's a cation. That's a bad one. That's called aluminum. It acts just like hydrogen. It's an acid. It's a bad acid. I put it in red. It's, it's a bad guy. It's OK to have a little, but not too much. So we've got to discern from our soil test report, is my blood pressure too high or not? Is my aluminum too high or not? So that's the soil test report. Tells me that. And then again, I got low bases and high acids, and all, all those two combined tell me my pH is low. So when I get a soil test report, the first thing I look at is soil pH. Where is it? And then I look at the bases and acids and then the nutrient level and determine whether I need that plot. We also have, uh, this is an anion. Uh, I don't show it as an anion, but phosphorus is really important. Most of our native soils in North Carolina are low in phosphorus, except if you found a field that had a long history of tobacco production. Uh, old growers back 100 years plus use this product called uh, 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 399, 3% nitrogen, 9% phosphorus, and 9% potassium. They put a ton of that on their tobacco, whether they needed it or not. So they built up soil P and K over many, 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 many decades of tobacco production, and a lot of our soils are pretty high in phosphorus. We also have a lot of soils in the coastal plain where our animal industry has been pretty active in the last uh, couple of gener generation or more, and so animal waste is loaded with phosphorus, and so use of animal waste also increases um, phosphorus. So when I decide at Home Depot to buy composted animal waste or fertilizer, the compost that animal waste does have a lot of phosphorus and micronutrients in it, no question. It's a really valuable source. And the other valuable part about it is it has carbon. So if I want to increase organic matter, I love to use organic animal waste products. If I'm needing to increase organic matter and I got nutrient needs that that material contains, no problem. But sometimes uh, it takes an awful lot of bags of that, which I'll point out at the end. Anyway, so. Let's switch gears and talk about water. We're going to come back and spend the second half of this uh, morning on nutrients. And so we're going to switch now to water and organic matter. Uh, so these altosols, they're relatively well drained, but they're pretty uh, high clay. Anybody have a garden, et cetera, that's pretty sandy? Coarse textured? Not too many, yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, uh, infiltration rate is low. If I don't have any roots or dead materials or that OA horizon we talked about, this is just bare soil. When the raindrop hits it, it's like an atomic bomb slamming into the soil surface, seals it off, infiltration stops, runoff goes crazy, and water doesn't get in. But if I can get water in, I got all kinds of nice large cracks and so forth that water can move through. So they are relatively well drained if I can keep that surface um, porous. That's the key. Porosity at the surface is really important to get water in. Uh, and then uh, a lot of times uh, you've inherited a field that's been farmed for hundreds of years with uh, heavy equipment, not contemporary equipment, but 
you know, 70 years ago we had steam engine tractors with big old wheels and a tractor was 10 tons. And uh, a lot of compaction. So we, we need to fix that and we'll do that with organic matter. So when I look at my soil, I take a volume of soil, quart jar or whatever, shovel full, a volume of soil. That soil volume is 50% solids and 50% air space. So the soils are made up of various kinds of solid particles, clay, sand, silt, which we're going to talk about the very next slide, what the difference between those are. It's the space between, if I pack in a jar of ping pong balls, is there not space between the ping pong balls? I'm not talking about the space inside the ping pong balls, can't get in there, but the space between. So that's the pore space, the space between these mineral particles of the soil. That's what holds the water. That's where your bacteria and your fungi and all that do their thing. That's where the roots do their thing. And about 5% of the solid material is, is very valuable. That's the life of our soil is the organic matter. That's the OM, organic matter. So pay attention to organic matter on your soil test report. Now, the rest of it is water air. That's the pore space. And if my soil is saturated right after, immediately after rain and there's water sitting on top, well, then this, all this space is full of water. It's saturated. Uh, my plants don't grow without oxygen. Roots don't survive without oxygen. So saturation's not good. For a matter of fact, on corn, uh, 72 hours and the plant's dead if you don't drain it. So, uh, and I can also have it completely air dry. Well, not completely, but close. I'd have to take it out and put it in an oven to completely drive all the water off, which you'll soon see here in a second. So it basically I get a variation in water content. And it just depends on, well, how long since the last rain, how much is my crops act, act, uh, uh, act uh, actively using water. That's about the transpiration. That's the major use of soil water is through the plant. Some evaporates from the soil, but the majority is evaporated through the plant, transpired through the plant. So, clay, sand, silt. These are the primary solid particles, sand, silt, and clay. We have clay soils. That means that we're dominated by the smallest particle, the little guy right here. This is sand particle. Just when I say sand, just visualize walking on a beach. Okay, walking on the beach. That's sand. Now sands have different size particles too within the, within the classification. So we're not going to go that far. But if my sand, my soil is dominantly sandy, you know that you know it's gritty. It doesn't stick together. It falls apart. Right. It's easy to soil sample. I love sampling soils that are sandy because they're easy to. Uh, not a lot of labor. Silt, why well, I've got uh, this medium sized particle and uh, they're really kind of a greasy feel. So can clay be as well, but not, not as much. They stick together. There's a lot of surface area in these small little particles. So notice this same area of the sand and each, how many clay particles would have to, I'd have to have to occupy that volume in one sand grain. It's billions and billions and billions and billions of clay particles. But the, if I pile up another sand particle and another sand particle, another sand particle, that space between the sand particles is much smaller than the space, if I added up all the pore space between all of those clay particles. So clays actually hold more water than sand. So uh, when you get a soil test report, you won't, they won't tell you what kind of soil you have, but uh, your agents here, your professionals here, got the soil survey manual, they'll tell you. You look up your farm, your field, your house, your property, whatever it is, and they'll tell you the soil type and tell you what, what you have. So again, they measure clay, silt, and sand content, and that determines your soil texture. So soil texture, when somebody says that word to you, that's the percentage of clay, 
sand and silt in that sample by weight. So clays usually have 30% or more of the soil is clay. That, that's usually a consider. Notice here's a percent clay, and I've got 50%. You can see I've got a lot of clay. But here's a clay loam. It's got 30% clay and some silt and some sand. Look at the sand. It's, that's, that's my beach. 90%, maybe there's not much clay in, on the beach, by the way. That's long been washed away. Anyway, what, what I'm really going to head for is, man, if I can get a soil that's this texture, that's the ideal from a water perspective, which I'll show you in a minute. So let's, uh, uh, and so when, you, when uh, Ashley says, okay, you've got a, a Cecil silt loam or silty clay, what does that mean? Well, that's what these words are. Percent sand, silt, and clay. Silt loam says most of it's silt. I got a little sand and a little clay. If it's clay, I got mostly clay and a little sand and a little silt. So I have all three in every soil sample, every one of your fields or, or gardens. It just changes the proportion. Now remember, if it's an old ag field, you don't have that topsoil anymore. You have that B horizon that's sitting on top, and that's got a lot more clay than the, than the surface. So, generally, uh, and then if you have a disturbed site from construction, I don't know what the heck you have. We have no idea. I remember, uh, I can't remember the football coach for the Steelers. Uh, he's now an announcer. Took him to the Super Bowl a few decades back. He began, huh? No, he, that was a quarterback. He's, this guy was a head coach. Chuck Noll. No. Uh, anyway, he's an old NC Stater. His wife was an NC State athlete, and he, he played for the Steelers and then, then uh, was their head coach. Took him to the Super Bowl a couple times. He lived in North Raleigh and uh, had a problem with uh, uh, his grass. This one big area about the side of the drive as you go up to his big house. Uh, always looked really bad. He couldn't, it just wouldn't grow and so forth and so on. When a landscape buddy of mine that I couldn't figure it out either, I said, well, did you take a soil probe with you? Well, he, well, yeah, he did, but it was only one of those little teeny ones that he couldn't get in very deep. So I have one with a seven pound hammer on the, side, on the top of it and I pound it in and he got six inches deep and that was an old area where they had the mound of gravel. And there was all kinds of gravel six inches yeah. out. They put a little made-up topsoil over, tried to lay the, lay the sod, and of course the sod roots went into that gravel and couldn't get any water. And that, that was a problem. So again, if you have issues like that, it, you got to go down and figure out if there's some problem deeper than what you can see at the surface. Coach Howard. Howard, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I knew some of one of you would get it. All right. Anyway, so let's just take a look at what happens with water with these different cells. So, I, again, I'm, I'm assuming that you don't really know what some of these words mean, but I, knew, I know you do. Infiltration. That's going in, water going in. Well, sand is pretty hot. I always tease my students. You like to go to the beach? What do you take when you go to the beach? Huh? Most of them towel, yeah. <laughs> they go sunscreen. <laughs> Listen to their mothers well, well didn't they? <laughs> well, no, college students. A cooler. Now, what's the cooler filled with? Water. Beer. Water. Yeah, beer. Mid <laughs> Ultra, that would be close to water, right? Okay, anyway. Beer. Okay, so I'm on the beach and I got a 12 pack in my cooler. And like a kid, I drank a lot of them. <laughs> and after an 11th beer, I got to get up and visit the ocean, right? <laughs> and I grab that 12th beer, and I can't walk very well, and so I fall down and spill the beer. What happens? It goes right in. Boom. Done. No runoff. Boom. Right? But if I was on a clay beach, what would happen? Not that I would want to go to a beach that was clay. <laughs> There would be very little of that beer go in, it would all run off. It would all run off. And that's because the pore size in between those sand particles is so big, it takes the water right in. But the pore size 
the space between each clay fire is so small, it can't take those water molecules in very fast. Now the total porosity of a volume of clay is more than the same volume of sand, but the pore size is much bigger in the sand, so I can get water in. So we'll talk about how that affects my decision about how much water do I irrigate my sandy soil or my clay soil or my loam soil, which we'll talk about in a second. Anyway, so the opposite, the infiltration and runoff are the opposite, which I'll show you in a minute. High infiltration on the sand, low infiltration on the clay, but high runoff. Percolation is the same thing, similar to infiltration, except the water's already in. It's now moving through the soil. So this is water into the top soil, into the surface. This is water moving through or drainage. So in the sand, I get lots of drainage. So before, because it doesn't hold much water, sand soil doesn't hold much water, once I start irrigating, boy, I can fill up those pores really fast, and I start to overwater, and I can push that water down. I can push any nutrients I've applied down. Uh, waste of water. Anyway, we'll talk about that. But the water holding capacity is low. So we, we need to understand this term. Uh, anyway, obviously aeration is high in the sand and it's, air, and it's lower in the clay and we can influence that with, with management and cropping, crop rotations and so forth. So again, water infiltration of water. When I'm managing water, I need to understand this relationship. It started to rain. Water it goes in quickly because the soil is dry, but it seals up fast, and so infiltration stops. As soon as infiltration stops, and runoff picks up. It can only go two places, in, in or off. So I need to make sure my soil surface is so, so porous that when it does rain and I need water to get down deeper or I'm irrigating, I make sure I've got that porosity at the surface to get that water in. Uh, uh, again, uh, I hesitate to go to this level of detail, but there's a sand. This is infiltration rate. This is time after the rainfall begins. Notice the infiltration rate is really high in a sand, beer on the beach, and it goes for a long time before it, the pores fill up with water and slows the infiltration down, which means increasing the run. But a clay, it doesn't, it doesn't infiltrate very long. Those pores fill up surface seals off and runoff begins. Anyway, I did wanted to just kind of generically talk about um, this property called drainage and infiltration and rainfall and evapotranspiration. So you can see the relationships between soil, water, and rainfall and crop water use. That's really what you're interested in is crop water use. And so you have a slide that, that uh, I've broken apart so I'm going to build that one slide in your notes. This is for a county in upper, upper uh, coastal plain, so west or east of Raleigh, but the rainfall is pretty consistent. Now this is 50-year averages. Obviously, there are years where it goes way up in here and there, a lot of variation. But on the average, over 50 years, that's what we, what we get. And then if I just take a look at ET, what's ET? That's not the movie. That's evapotranspiration. That's water moving into the root hairs, up the root, up the stem, out the leaves. That's a physics thing that causes that. And notice I have no ET here, here. So my war rainfall is greater than my plant requirement. So my soils fill up. But here, I got July and August, right? It's you, July and August. I got lots of plant growth. I got lots of... Those crops are using water like crazy. They're using more than it rains. So I'm hoping that I can store some and I've got crops that have roots that can go down and get it. Because if it's carrots or radishes, they're not going to have roots to go down and get them. They're likely, likely going to need to add a little water if I'm growing radishes or carrots in that kind of a season. But most of those are already harvested by, by then. Anyway. Um, so plant rooting system is important. And then uh, soil water. I measure how much water I do have in my rooting depth. And notice, if I don't have any crop water use, and 
I get this amount of rainfall, my soil water builds up. And when I have ET greater than rainfall, my soil water drops down very low. And I get very droughty conditions of a crop if I'm not, if I'm not careful. And then it goes back up. Well, when I have soil water and no ET, I fill up all the pores, what's going to happen? I get drainage. I get water moving down below the root zone, and that's why our soils over millennia have become acid, because of all that water moving down through the profile over millions and millions of years of soil formation. So that basically is the relationship between how plants use water, and drainage, and rainfall uh, in your field. So let's uh, take a microscope and go to a soil clay particle. There it is. So I've blown it up millions of times so I can see it. I can't see it with the naked eye, but that's a clay particle. And if I could see the water molecules, I'd have a whole bunch of water molecules stuck to the surface of that clay. Now why is that? Well, the clay is charged. It has some negative charge to it and positive charges, but so is the water molecule. It's polar, so there's a negative end and a positive end. So the negative positive end of the water molecule is attracted to the surface of the clay particle and is stuck there. Just sits there. Well there, and then I got a, a, a positive end, a, a negative end out here, so the positive end of that water molecule sticks to the first layer and just builds up these layers. So if I had all the water, I took a soil sample and laid it on my driveway and let it, the sun beat on it, and it's basically air dry. I can still take that soil sample and find water attached to the clay part. That's called oven dry. Well, we never do that. Just to let you know that there's always water in your soil. The question is, can my plants get it? And the answer is no, they can't. They can't get this water. It's held too tightly to the soil particles. The strength of that absorption of those water molecules against that clay particle is too tight, too strong. The plant can't pull it off. So we call that point, don't worry about any of this, permanent wilting point. That's a parameter that master gardeners throw around every now and then with each other. Permanent wilting point. My plant went lit and fell over. Well, you were at permanent wilting point because the roots couldn't get the water away from the clay. And notice, if I keep adding water, it keeps building up until I got so much water, it's, it's attracted to that charged clay particle, but it's now it's so far away, the physical force of gravity exceeds the attractive force of that water molecule way out here to the clay particle that the water moves out. That's called gravitation, that's drainage. The plant available water is defined by this term called field capacity. That's where the drainage starts or stops and permanent wilting point. So that's your plant available water right there. You don't want your soil saturated. You don't want your soil down here. So you get, again, that 50% pore space varies between all full of water or no water. But you always have still a little water. Involved. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, let's just take a look. Uh, I, I think this is a really good way of determining, well, how does the total water of a clay uh, relate to the total water of a sand? So I have 100 milliliters of cylinder, doesn't matter what the volume is, it's just the relative uh, size. The, the, the amount of soil is the same in each one. I have sand, sill, clay. Are you with me? Sand, sill, and clay. If I filled up all the pores, that saturation, it would take only 15 mils of water to do it in the sand, but it would take 40 mils of water to do it in the clay. Again, the pore space is greater than clay. So it can hold more water. That's good if I'm irrigating. I got, I got a clay that holds lots of water. I only have to irrigate once a week during July and August, if it never rains. So again, sands hold small amount of water, clays hold a great amount of water. 
So let's take a quick peek at the relationship between water, plant available water, and the sand and the clay. Remember permanent wilting point? So the water content at permanent wilting is pretty small. This is inches of water per foot of soil. Pretty small. And I got more inches of water per foot of soil even at permanent wilting point in a clay because it's smaller particles, it holds more water. But it's still, I got almost three inches of water in that clay soil in a foot of soil, but it, it's not available to the plant. It's permanent wilting point. Field capacity, I've got four and a half inches in the clay. So I only have an inch and a half of plant available water in this clay. It's an inch and a half. Oops, I was told not to move past the table here. Baseball bat's coming. Okay. <laughs> and notice this sand. I got half an inch and I got almost an inch and a half, so I basically have an inch. Not much difference. Almost twice. Not quite. Between sand and clay. Total plant available water. So clays are hard to manage for water, and so are sands. But look at all the plant available water I have in a soil that has a pretty even mixture of sand, silt, clay. Unfortunately, not many of you have one of those. You have soil out here. But that's okay. We'll manage it. So let's take a look. This slide kind of summarizes the principles. You have this on your, no, sand. High infiltration, low water only capacity, when I'm irrigating, I got to do it frequently. It doesn't hold much water. If I let that, sprink, that sprinkler go on for a couple hours, I'm adding more water to that soil can hold. So, drainage. Silt, medium infiltration, it goes in pretty well, but very high water holding capacity. I can water that once a week and we're good to go. This one. Low infiltration, very high water holding capacity, but I can't get the water in. So if I have a high output inches per hour of irrigation or rainfall, I get runoff to happen pretty fast, so I can't get water. So when I have clay or sand, I've got to really pay attention to how I irrigate or uh, manage that water. And you remember the drought of 2007? No? Yes? Worst drought in North Carolina history. It was almost 15 months of no rainfall. 15 months. And uh, Falls Lake, you know Falls Lake, right? Lost about two thirds of its volume. It was, it was basically just a couple of puddles left. Well, it, you know, a lot of irrigation of big two acre houses in North Raleigh and various places, a lot of lawn watering golf courses and so forth, and they didn't pay attention and they went to every other day watering restrictions early on in June and July, and then by the time August came around, we realized we didn't have enough water to meet the human demands, screw the grass, and so they just said no irrigating, no irrigating. And uh, uh, we can do better. We can do better. So I teach my, I won't teach you today, but I, can teach, we te I teach my students to to take a look at well, what kind of grass do I have, what's its crop water use, what's my expected rainfall, how much will my soil hold, clay, sand, silt, how much water will it hold, and just do a simple balance and say, does my rainfall and soil water holding capacity meet my crop water demand, the water use for my crop? And if it doesn't, I know I've got to add, add some water. Well, where am I going to get it? Well, first thing I have to do is figure out how much rainfall I get. Is that enough? And if that's not enough, I got to irrigate. But that, I didn't do more than that. How much irrigation do we need? And if homeowners did that, you know, their systems, they just set timers. Every other day, it goes on for an hour. Uh, that's bad. Now the, the more sophisticated irrigation systems now have soil water sensors. And they're hooked up to a computer, and when the soil water sensor gets close, says it's getting close to permanent wilting point, the system turns on and adds the appropriate amount of water. So, but they're very expensive right now. The price will come down as it always does. So anyway, when I decide how much water I need, uh, you know that uh, oh, uh, during the growing season, most of it's got to be here because ET is higher. So I don't apply the same amount in May as I do in June, July, and August. Just, I think you kind of understand that. Anyway, so 
So again, this crop water use thing is really important to know that uh, most of the water that's in the soil is evapotranspired through the plant. We have some evaporation from the soil surface, but majority of 80% of that water is driven through the plant. And that's what you want. Uh, and your plant will tell you if you're dry. Yes, sir. Yes, there's all, all those environmental factors influence evapotranspiration. So the more water I have in my, mostly it's temperature driven. And growth stage, if I'm in that vegetative growth stage, stage on rapidly developing leaves, my water use is very high. But in, if I'm just thinking about corn now, if I'm growing an ear and all my plant leaves are green, it's not starting to desiccate yet, so we're not at maturity, then I've got the highest plant water use and there's a, still a high plant demand. Humidity has an influence of, of the, the more humid it is, the less evapotranspiration I can get, but temperature is the main driver. Good question. So again, when I see plants, uh, normal water, start to see stress, this is not what you, what, you see this, you, you got issues. You all have house plants, and you all struggle with this wilting thing on a house plant. You take a week off and go somewhere, and you get. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry I didn't mean to do that. Just remember that most of the water use is in the surface foot or two. I do have, if I have deep rooted plants that can get down there, and I did allow water to move down, infiltrate, and percolate down to these lower depths, that water. Is good plant of all growers, farmers in North Carolina depend on when deep rooted crops depend a lot on that water uh, for later in the season. Um, but don't overestimate your rooting depth. I've worked with wine grapes a lot, and uh, two meters of roots in wine, no way, no way. I mean, the plant's really tall, but the roots aren't. I have probably 20 to 24 inches of roots, that's it. So I'm um, basically managing water and nutrients in a very shallow, shallow soil. Anyway, so again, when you're gardening uh, issues, be, be well aware of the differences in root structure. I can't, with these kind of crops, I can't get those roots down there where there's additional water. So I've got to manage, irrigate, et cetera. Most of these kinds of crops are irrigated. Beets and radishes and, in, in the United States. Anyway, so let's switch gears to uh, soil organic matter. Soil organic matter holds a lot of water. I just talked about sand sales clay. Organic matter holds a lot more water per mass of organic matter than any of the minerals do. They're very fine particles and they hold a lot of water. You've heard about soil health, right? Okay. Uh, we always manage our soils to make sure that when I turn that soil over to the next generation, it's more productive than when I found it. That's the future of that sustaining life on the planet. If we don't do that, we're in real trouble. And we've got places on the planet that haven't done that, but now we're starting to recover those soils like Sub-Saharan Africa and other places. Every time I use that as an example, I've had folks accuse me of picking on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm not. It just has a very long history of soil degradation. So most of those soils are very degraded. And their inputs, availability of inputs is low, but we, we, in the last 20 years, there's been a huge recovery uh, and uh, adoption of cropping rotations and residue use and so forth to increase organic matter. Some of those soils are starting to respond very, very nicely, and they, their, their yield production, their ability to feed themselves uh, is really, really increasing rapidly. It's great. But I want to just point out some soil degrading processes, soil erosion, that's the biggest one, that's what's happened in North Carolina, causes organic matter loss. So there's my soil profile. Notice I don't have the O&A anymore. I drew this purposely uh, to show you that that's gone in many of our Piedmont soils. Long gone. It's down there in the, 
intercoastal waterway. Uh, but we have conservation practices. You, you know what cover cropping means. I'm going to talk about that. You know some of these things, crop rotation, no-till, reduced tillage, etc. I'm not going to go through all of those, but those are technologies that humans have come with, up with to keep soil in place and to enhance soil productivity. So the first thing is to recognize that uh, soil erosion is a combination of physical loss of topsoil, but also a, a loss of organic matter. I can have a flat field and till the heck out of it and decrease organic matter and not lose any topsoil to soil erosion. So I can still lose organic matter and that productivity of that soil go down even though it's nice and flat and it's, I don't have any runoff, physical loss of topsoil. I just wanted to share with you that uh, in the United States, actually all over the world, that we have these long-term plots. We have five or six or seven of them in the United States that have been in production now well over 100 years, these experiments, these rotations. And uh, we've measured uh, organic matter all over that time and uh, about 50% of the organic matter, initial organic in the virgin soil, never been touched by human hands, 50% is lost in the first 50 years. It takes centuries and centuries to, to make it and we can lose 50% in just five, five decades. So here's sort of, this is percentage of organic matter loss of the virgin soil. So our Oregon's not too bad. Only lose 30%, took 80, 40% took 80 years. 50% only took 50 years. There's my Kansas, they're, they're uh, I'm sorry, 30% 50 years. Kansas is about 50% organic matter loss in 50 years. Australia, very harsh, dry, Environment, I lost 50%, uh, it only took 30 years. I lost more, so there's, there's 70%, 70% in 50 years. So which environment is North Carolina more like? This one? So we, we have problems, so you have problems. So the best thing you can do is all those practices, the increase solar organic matter and you will be rewarded in your lifetime. And the generation behind you will be rewarded even greater. And that's the key. So again, when I start out with the soil, I lose most of the organic matter, all right? In 50 years, oops, hit the wrong button. There's 50 years. And then I adopt, then you took over the land and I did, I, I stopped tilling it or tilled it less. I started growing cover crops. I bought some compost. Put in, I added more carbon than I could possibly add with my crop rotation, other vast management practices, and I started to increase my organic matter. That's where you're headed. So let's, uh, let's uh, get our soils to be alive. The more organic matter I have, the more alive they are, and the more productive they're going to be, and the more they're going to reward you if you do that. So this is a little extreme. But in a virgin situation, I got all kinds of critters. I got microbes I can't see. I got birds that live there. I got rats and moles. And I got all kinds of, of insects, skeletal insects, and not excess, exoskeletal insects. I got all kinds of earthworm. I got all kinds of life. That's what, that's what we want. <clears throat> what does that life do? It produces these compounds, organic compounds, that help property called aggregation, and I need you to understand this term called aggregation. It is so important to take in those clay particles and sticking them together like cement into larger particles. I got all kinds of little clay particles in there, but they're all stuck together, and now I got a larger pore space that goes between those aggregates. Without organic matter, there's no glue doesn't work on the sand. So there's a soil that's uh, not very well aggregated. I can't even get a root through there. There's the one that's optimum aggregation. That's what you want. You want soil that uh, has got lots of organic. So there's a clay that uh, is aggregated. You can see the clay. Little clay particles are stuck together and 
Each one of these is an aggregate. Notice this larger pore between the aggregates. That lets water infiltrate more in a clay soil. I said it couldn't get water to infiltrate in a clay soil. You can if it's well aggregated. So how do I get one of our clay soils to take in more water is make sure I have high organic matter content. <coughs> and lots of tubies uh, sticking out of the ground, old dead residue, that helps too. Anyway, I just showed an example of a soil as well, poorly aggregated one that's well, difference in root proliferation. I can get more water, more nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all right. So again, my healthy soil is well aggregated, my uh, poor soil is not very well aggregated, and again, you're gonna find, them. these are clay soils. So uh, that's where we're headed. So what does it do? It increases, since I've got this good aggregation, it increases the larger pores, so I get water in, higher infiltration, more water capacity because I got more organic matter. My roots can grow deeper to go get the water. Everything works together. And then because I have this organic fraction, I have a bigger engine of converting organic nutrients to inorganic nutrients naturally. So what is the measure? Can you, I mean, obviously you can see the difference. Yes. Do you measure the amount of organic? We, we do have a bulk density is a, is a parameter. We don't measure that normally in a soil test report, but bulk density is the parameter. There is a, a measure we do called aggregate, aggregate stability. We take the aggregates physically out of the soil and immerse them in various chemicals and water and see how stable they are. And uh, the higher the organic matter, generally, the greater the aggregate stability, and the lower the bulk density. So uh, your soil that's compacted, no A or A horizon, has a relatively high bulk density. Infiltration is going to be low. Runoff is going to be high. Nutrients are generally low. Increase the organic matter content from less than 1% to 2%. It's hard to do unless you import carbon. So you're going to have to buy carbon and get it onto your soil uh, as quickly as you can. The more carbon you can buy, the better. So uh, the only thing the soil test tells you is the organic matter level. How much organic matter doesn't really tell you a whole lot about aggregation. So if I want to increase carbon, organic matter, I've got to do this. You just got to change the carbon balance. You gotta add more carbon than I'm losing. And when I take carbon in the soil, the microbes, the, the huge pool of microbes that are in that soil, fungi, bacteria, take 65% of that carbon that you added as residue and convert to CO2. It's called the carbon cycle. It goes back in the atmosphere. 35% is retained by the organisms in making new soil organic matter. So I just have to add more carbon. So uh, again, how do I do that? Well, uh, maintain surface plant cover, add, uh, 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 change rotations that produce more carbon. For example, cotton and soybeans uh, and crops that do not leave much residue behind. So very little carbon. So increase grasses like wheat and not, not in your gardens and so forth, but sweet corn and grass plants that, that produce lots of carbon. Uh, and, then, and then of course we're going to have to add, uh, add carbon. And then uh, try not to till so much. Yes? So from a garden perspective, um, I, I'm thinking about um, you know, maybe the viruses. Yes. They do look ugly. So what we're saying is we shouldn't do that. We should leave them because they're really going to be the organic matter. Yes, that's free carbon. But there is an interaction with diseases. So I, you need to talk to the plant path people to make sure that that residue on the soil surface, I'm going back with irises the ne very next season, which of course that's a, that's a permanent crop, right? They come back. Uh, that might inc increase incidence of disease. Okay. So sometimes that residue has to be removed okay. to prevent the buildup of organisms that cause disease pressure on the next year's crop. We have the same problem with wine grapes. They, they trim, 
uh, leaves off the lime grapes during production to keep the airflow going and to reduce foliar and cluster diseases. But those canes that they trim off, they, they remove those. And it's a disease thing. So it's a little more complicated than just <laughs> leaving everything in the soil surface. Yeah. So is there some sort of like something that can be grown that has like biomass and sort of like process it and put it down? Is that like a regular? Yes, there, there are. As a matter of fact, if every one of you could take your field before you started doing whatever you're doing, and just grow uh, hairy vetch for a year. Now you're gonna, if you let it go to seed, you're gonna have volunteer hairy vetch, you're gonna have to fight. But it'll produce masses, mass amounts of biomass and you just incorporate that back into your soil. That's a big, big stuff. Or try to figure out if you can buy composted materials. One word of caution. If you buy compost, make sure you get a waste analysis report. Because you can go to the municipal city and you can get composted yard waste. You don't know what that means. You don't know what they, where they've got that material. And they're supposed to, by regulation, provide you with a waste analysis report. Because they may have used some materials that are extremely acidic and they didn't use enough lime, so we want to make sure we've got the right pH, but also micronutrients like zinc and manganese and some others that might be, they use some material that were loaded up. And so the waste analysis report is absolutely crucial. We, we bought a bunch of soil from a local place like in bulk and it had residue in it from stuff they sprayed hay with to keep stuff from growing on it and it, and it killed it killed. a lot of the yeah. you know, vegetable plants. That yeah. to some of those pesticides have a residual value that yeah. common theme though, walk away from, is keep your surface covered all year long. Never leave it bare. The microbes don't like it. The life in the soil does not like bare soil. So if you want to keep your soil nice and organic matter rich, keep it covered with dead or live residue all year long. So like mulch. Yes, yes. Or a cover crop. A cover crop is a mulch, but it's a live crop. Again, cover crop uses nutrients. You're going to return that cover crop, so those nutrients are going to get cycled back, but it also uses water. So make sure when you're using a cover crop and you're growing the spring, you're getting ready to plant your crop, your cover crop hasn't, lose, hasn't used all that water that you need to use for your marketable crops. So the um, burning off of the lawn is not a good thing? No. No. You mean with with fire or fire. pesticides? Fire. Fire, no. That immediately takes all the carbon and oxidizes it to CO2. You want to you want to leave that in there. You want to leave that carbon if you can. Now, there are reasons why I would burn, because I'm trying to get an implement through that soil and I don't want to drag it through a lot of residue. So I want to get rid of that residue. Back in the old days when they grew winter wheat in the Palouse Valley of Washington and Oregon, uh, they had a variety of wheat that, that yielded really well, but the residue, this wheat was that tall. So they couldn't get the old farm implements through to plant the next wheat crop. So they burned all that residue every year. The massive fires out that food area. They don't do that anymore. Now they've got equipment that can get through that residue and produce wheat. Anyway, I don't care what kind of plant you use, dead or alive. Doesn't matter, as long as it's, long as it's planted. Anyway, on your, on your uh, sheet, you can see all the benefits that, that, each, that these residues provide. I'm not gonna spend any time, so you can read those on your own. i just show you a couple of photos. You know, I, I, I can't even tell you what, this is corn, this is an, at somebody's farm field, they've grown some legumes in here. Uh, Anyway, he's going to run over that and harvest that corn with a combine. This is not a garden, this is a farm field. But that's a cover crop that was seeded uh, uh, before the corn got up too tall. There's a garden, you can kind of see. The problem with this, again, is this cover crop that's alive, it's using water and nutrients. 
So if you don't adjust your water management, nutrient management for the use of that crop, you're, you're, these crops are going to suffer. So in this environment, with the water use that we have, ET that we have, I like dead stuff in between. But if you can make it work, um, and some folks do, you just have to have a water source around. Anyway, here's some dead residue you can kind of see put between some gardens. Uh, be careful about buying some of this because you get weed seeds coming in and, and you'll have, have some weed issues later on that you might need to deal with. But if you keep everything mulched up good, the weeds have a hard time coming through. Yes? Is it beneficial to use biochar? Yes, yes. Biochar. Can you tell us what biochar is? Um, it's pretty much charcoal. So yes, yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah. This soil, but yeah. also carbon rich. Very carbon rich. Very it carbon is, rich. Some people say it's like not beneficial. I used it this year for my green on my mom's lawn. Yes. And it it did tremendous work for the lawn, but I was wondering like is biochar. There, the, uh, my experience with biochar has always been more positive than negative. Usually I use it in a soil that's very low in the soil organic matter. When I want a huge increase in soil organic matter, I try to figure out a way to use that or sawdust. Biochar. Bio, B-I-O-C-H-A-R. Biochar. You can Google it and you get this massive amounts of documents. Not strong, no. No, the problem with, with uh, sawdust is there's no nitrogen in it. So if I put sawdust on and, and try to plant sweet corn or whatever right afterwards, a non-legume without enough nitrogen, it won't grow. And if the chunks are big, then they don't break down very fast. I'm talking about sawdust, where the particles are very, very high surface area, the microbes can attack it. They're gonna take all the nitrogen they can find to break down that carbon and your plant won't get it. Remember, the microbes go to the dinner table first. So when you add residue and you don't have, and it's a high carbon to nitrogen residue, you've got to make up, you've got to add some nitrogen to feed the microbes to break the residue down and to meet your crop needs. So if you have a cover crop, um, but you're also trying to not till, how do you incorporate the cover crop in without Good question. <laughs> I knew I could slip that one by. I knew that. <laughs> That's a very good question. You, there's just no way. If you're, got, if you're going to want to incorporate something so that you can easy, more easily manage your target crop, then you just do it. You just, you just incorporate it. What you try not to do is incorporate it in such a way as to leave the, so, the surface so bare and you're on a slope and you do it ahead of the rainy season. You, you, you're trying to figure out a way to minimize runoff. So you, so you don't, you could terrace it slope is going down, you, 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 you have some terraces or you have some grass rows every 20 feet or so, so if it do get run off, it doesn't keep going down the hill. So there are ways to, to, get, to still incorporate residue without damaging your soil too bad. Yes? No? Okay. All right, break time. <laughs>